dimensions d. And uh, as I as I said, the way we can uh, we can analyze this equation is to take a certain number of derivatives of of functions. So let me take these functions h k and let me consider a vector a. Uh, well, let me write it a delta l, which is a vector. Uh, vector of derivatives of these functions h, k with respect to z and z bar uh, corresponding to this delta and l at the point z equals z bar equals one half. And so then I have uh, then I have this equation so sum uh, okay, let me call this, so sum over L, sum over spins, sum over deltas, for I which exists for this spin. So let me denote it X delta L, A delta L. So these are just F squared, so these are positive numbers, non-negative numbers. So this has to be equal to the vector b, which is just 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, this kind of vector. So this is the, uh, this is the kind of equation that I have. And here, alpha plus beta. So I take all derivatives up to some uh, alpha plus beta up to some large number lambda, which can be several hundreds. And so this is the equation. This is the equation that I need to analyze. And the way uh, I'm going to analyze it, the way I'm going to analyze it, will be in an oracle mode. So let me explain what I mean by that. So when you have an equation, when you have an equation, there are two ways to approach the equation. One way would be to say, uh, well, let me try to solve an equation. Let me try to solve this equation. Let me try to find solutions. So this is an extremely daunting task because this is an equation for infinitely many variables. And moreover, it's a functional equation. So it's basically infinitely many equations. So we have infinitely many equations for infinitely many derivatives. And we have infinitely many unknowns, which are these x's. So what are the unknowns here? The unknowns are the deltas, l's, and x's. So there are infinitely many unknowns. Mm. So to solve it head-on would be a daunting and an impossible task. So a different way uh, to analyze this equation would be to say, well, a more modest way would be to say, well, uh, let me try just let me try to make some assumptions about this equation. Like, uh, there are some, there are infinitely many parameters here, and uh, you know, a priori they can take any values. But let me just make some assumptions about the values of these parameters, of some of these parameters, and let me try to see if there exists any solution to this equation, rather than just trying to find uh, any particular solution. So this, this is what I would call an oracle mode. So, so what are the kind of assumptions that I'm going, I'm going to consider? So the assumption, so I'm going to make an assumption, an assumption about the spectrum. So the spectrum of operators in phi times phi OPE. So the phi times phi OPE is going to contain the unit operator, always. And, well, it's going to contain infinitely many operators, but the one which I'm going to be mostly interested in is the operator, okay, I'm going to call it O delta zero, so this is the uh, lowest dimension scalar operator. 
in this OPE. So I'm assuming that it contains this uh, O delta zero and then contain any operator, any scheme uh, of dimension larger than, so, no, delta zero, right? Because this is the lowest, so any scalar above this dimension is allowed. Uh, plus, it can contain any spin 2 with dimension uh, larger than actually any even spin L with dimension larger than L plus D minus 2. This is just the unitarity bound. So as you see, the only assumption I'm making here is the value of this delta zero. So this is a very minimal, this is a very minimal assumption. And then, you know, is there a solution? So for given, for given delta zero, is there a solution? So, okay, here by solution I mean, can I find uh, x delta, x delta L uh, to make it work? Positive, no negative, to make it work. You see, finding x delta l's to make it work means, in particular, finding all these other operators. So here I'm allowing, I'm allowing all these other operators to range in these uh, intervals from delta 0 to infinity and from the unitarity bound to infinity. So I'm allowing them to range arbitrarily. I'm allowing arbitrarily many operators to appear in those ranges. And can I find those operators and I can, can I find their positive coefficients to make it work? So this, this is the kind of an assumption that I can make. So once again, the spectrum, so the spectrum of my theory, so let me draw the spectrum. So this is going to be delta, and this is going to be spin. And so it's going to be spin zero. The spectrum of spin zero in this OPE is going to consist of operator of dimension delta zero and anything above delta zero. Here, everything, anything is allowed. And then for spin two, there's going to be the stress tensor, which is going to have dimension exactly equal to D. So this is going to be T mu nu of dimension D. And then again, anything above is also allowed. Okay, and then spin four, uh, similarly, is going to be unitarity bound and anything above is allowed. So this is the kind of an assumption I make. It's a very, very minimal assumption. I can make, uh, you know, the, the moment you understand that you can make this assumption, you can easily, uh, you can easily come up with more complicated assumptions. But this is the simplest one. Yes? Yes, you fix also the dimension of phi. So you fix... Yeah, so phi will have dimension delta phi. And so in this analysis, the only two parameters are delta phi and delta zero. So, uh, so that's, this is the kind of question I'm going to ask. And how am I going uh, to approach this question? So I, um, you know, in practice, how am I going to do it? So At this stage, when we passed from the functional equation that I erased to this equation for derivatives, I simplified the problem because now I have a finitely many equations. Before I had infinitely many equations. Now I have finitely many equations. But the trouble here is that uh, 
I still have infinitely many unknowns. So you cannot put this equation on the computer yet because there are infinitely many unknowns. So I have to, uh, I, I have to come up with an equation which has finitely many unknowns. And uh, how am I going to do it? You know, given that I assumed that the dimensions can vary from delta zero to infinity, to make uh, to make it into a, a system with finitely many unknowns, I have to do something. For example, I have to discretize. So uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to discretize. So I'm going to discretize uh, delta with some step, with some small step. which can be very small, can be like one, one thousand or something like that. So I'm only going to allow dimensions in this range. So a priori they vary continuously, but I'm going to allow them to vary only with a very small step. Because I don't know where this, these operators are going to happen. So I have to allow all of them to begin with. But you know, whether it's going to have a dimension 10 or dimension 10 plus a thousand is not going to, vary to, to matter much for this equation. So I'm going to discretize. So I'm going to discretize this going to the first thing. I'm going to truncate, truncate uh, delta. I'm going to allow only delta up to some large dimension delta max, which can be very huge, something like a thousand. Well, a thousand probably is, is even an overkill, but you can take it a hundred. And the reason why this is um, uh, this is reasonable is because, uh, as I motivated, I did not really prove it, but I motivated it. This uh, this representation for the four-point function from which everything originated is a convergent representation. So, and it's particularly it's convergent particularly fast at the point z equals z bar equals one half. So if you drop all the operators which have dimension larger than 100, then you are going to make an error in this, uh, in this equation of the order 1 half to the 100. And this error is going to be completely negligible. So this is a, a, a reasonable thing to do. And similarly, I can also truncate, truncate to spins uh, L smaller than some L max, uh, which can also be 100. And the reason why I can do this is simply that there is a unitarity bound. So the operators of spin 100, they necessarily have dimension larger than 100. So by truncating spins, I'm essentially truncating also in the dimension. So this, these are the assumptions that I'm going to make and uh, nice thing about these assumptions is that you can do do a calculation and then you can redo this cal the same calculation at larger values of this truncation parameters and a smaller discretization step and you can see whether the results change or not if they don't change then then uh, then it's okay so once I did this I now have uh, a system with finitely many variables, with a, a huge but finitely many variables. So I have a, I have I have a system of the form. I have an equation of the form sum x i. So I'm just going to rename all the variables uh, by by an index i and you know from from one to some huge number and then I have a system of the form sum x i a i is equal and I have to uh, I have to answer a question where this system has a solution or not so subject to the constraint that all xi's are positive. So uh, 
so it, the crucial thing to pay attention to is that this system has many, many, many more unknowns than equations. Because I, okay, I kept here, say, 100 derivatives, so the length of this vector b is 100, but, you know, after I did all the discretizations, I can have millions of variables xi. So there are many, many more unknowns than, uh, so it's not at all a quadratic matrix where, uh, where uh, I have a, a linear system. So if I had a quadratic matrix, then I could just invert the matrix, I could find x, and then I could see whether the solution that I get has all x as positive or not. But now I have not a quadratic matrix. I have a matrix which is, uh, which is uh, very, very long. And, you know, if I did not have this constraint, then the system would have always a solution, practically always. So this constraint, the, the positivity constraint, is crucial to make uh, things restrictive, you know, to... to to make it happen that sometimes the system does not is not going to have a solution. And actually, this problem, this kind of problems, have a name. So it's it goes under the name uh, linear programming. And uh, a fact which is perhaps little known in uh, among physicists, but is is very well known among uh, economists that linear programming co programs, linear programming problems of this kind, have very efficient algorithms uh, to be solved. So in fact, in, in, in Mathematica, there is a function called linear programming which solves this kind of problems. And uh, one famous algorithm to, uh, to solve this kind of problems is called Danzig it's it was proposed by Danzig in forty seven and it's called simplex method. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to give you an idea of how this simplex method works. So I think it's a it's a good thing to to know how it works. But before before I go there, uh I would like to pause for any questions. Up, are there any questions up to this point? Yeah. Yes. So, in fact, this index i just numbers various possible choices of deltas and l's which remain after the discretization. Order of magnitude of what? It can be easily a million or a hundred thousand, yeah. So um. Yeah, essentially you can do an independent truncation, but essentially once you truncate in the dimension, you also truncate it in spin because of the unitarity bound. Okay, so it's a, it's a nice piece of mathematics, so let's... And according to the questionnaire, uh, it was not particularly widely known for this audience, so let me explain how this works. Is this So, so let me then, let me be mathematical here. So I have this uh, huge matrix A, 
which has uh, which has m rows and n columns, and n is going to be much larger than m. So in practice, I'm going to have n much larger than m. So I'm going to write this. Uh, so I'm considering. So I'm going. I'm going to represent this matrix A as a collection of columns. So A1, uh, A2, A n. And I'm also going to consider uh, a vector B, which is a, an m component vector. And I'm going to consider this. And then component vector C. And I'm going to consider the following problem. So, so let's impose constraints xi are positive, a times x, which is just uh, some xi ai has to be equal to b. And in addition to this, uh, let me throw in a condition that I have to minimize C times X. Subject to these constraints. So you see, I'm, con I'm considering a more complicated problem now than the problem that I considered before. So before, my problem was given these constraints, xi positive and ax is equals to b, is there any point x which satisfies these constraints? Now I'm considering a more complicated problem. Not only find a point which satisfies these constraints, but also minimize this linear function c times x. And uh, so basically, the key idea why this problem is going to have a solution, is going to have a simple solution, is that uh, the system, if you have uh, a system of linear inequalities like xi positive and a system of lin linear equalities like ax is equal, is equal to b, then uh, the set of points of all points x which satisfies these constraints, if it's not empty. It's going to be a convex set. So, so what I'm doing here, I'm minimizing a linear function on the convex set. And what is important is that this, so what convex set is something like that. And I have a linear function. And these are the level, the level, uh, the levels of this linear function, and so a linear function minimized on a convex set will have a minimum, which necessarily lies at the vertex, at the vertex of the of the boundary. In general. Minimization problems are hard because you can get trapped in the local minimum and you don't know if your minimum is local or global. If you have a linear function on the convex set, then there is no danger of being trapped in a local minimum. So what the algorithm is going to do is going to basically go along the boundary of this convex set, which satisfies these constraints, and it will follow the edges from one vertex to the other so that at every step, the function, the, the cost function, this with the minimizing, this is a cost function. So we are, we are just going to do steepest descent for the cost function until we reach the point of the absolute minimum. So that's, uh, that's how it's going to work. Whether the solution to be unique, so the, m the minimum is not necessarily unique. So sometimes it can happen that if, for example, the the function that you're minimizing is parallel to this edge 
of to the to the to one of the edges of the boundary, then everywhere along this edge it's going to have the same value. Uh, but you can always find a vertex which has the minimal value of the cost function. So we are going to just go from from one vertex to the other vertex. Not not necessarily. C has arbitrary coefficients. You're wondering what can happen. Can it happen that there's going to be a runaway and you will go to the minus infinity? This can happen, but then the algorithm will discover this. So in this case, there's going to be no minimum. The minimum is going to be equal to minus infinity. So, so let us suppose then, so let us take a vertex. Let us take some vertex of this problem. Let us take a vertex. Satisfying these constraints. So by vertex I mean, uh, so vertex is going to have, so here I have m constraints, but I have n variables. And so a vertex is going to have the maximal value of the inequalities saturated. So a vertex is going to have, uh, so there's going to be exactly m xi non-zero, and the rest is going to be zero. So let me take uh, let me take the matrix A and let me divide it into two pieces. So the variables which are non-zero, these are called basic variables. This is just terminology. So let me take my vector A, my matrix A, and let me divide it into two matrices. So the one which I'm going to call A B and A N. So A B are the columns which correspond to the basic variables. So these are basic columns. And similarly, I'm going to divide x into the basic variables and non-basic variables. So, so at the initial vertex, so xn equals 0 at the initial vertex. So you see, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm given a vertex. So th this, is, uh, this is an important point. So given a vertex, now I'm going to show you how you, how you can decrease the cost function. There is a, a separate question, how, how did I find the initial vertex? This is, this is a non-trivial point and I'm going to discuss it later. But for now, let's assume that somebody gives us an initial vertex. So at the at the initial vertex I have a b x b equals b. This is the equation I, I have satisfied. Because all the other x n's are equal to zero. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to allow so now allow so I, I want to start at the, at the initial vertex, and I want to move uh, in some direction, always satisfying the constraints. And I want to see if by doing this, I can decrease my cost function. So what, I'm, what it means is that now I'm going to turn on. So the next step is that I'm going to turn on some other variable xk which is which is uh, which was not in th among these basic variables so what i'm going uh, to so turn on xk so now i have an equation abxb 
plus uh, ak xk equals b. So I don't know which one, which variable xk do I have to turn on, but let me just turn on one random xk variable to begin with. So of course, when I turn on xk, I have to adjust the values of xb variables. So how do I have to adjust them? So you see, now that in this picture, the, the size, so this matrix AB is M times M square matrix. So now I can, the, cha the, the change in XB is just given by, so XB is just given by uh, AB minus first, AB inverse, B minus uh, XK, AK. So I know precisely how it changes. So this is the change in XB. But now what I want to say, uh, what I want to ask is whether the cost function decreases or increases once I do this, once I do this change. So the change in the cost function is, uh, so I have to compute CB XB plus CK XK. So this is the new value of the cost function. And now I plug in this new value of XB into this formula. And I find that this is equal to, uh, so I have CB uh, transpose uh, AB minus first B. This is just the original value of the cost function plus uh, plus xk times uh, ck minus mm, ab minus first ak. No, sorry, uh, cb transpose ab minus first ak. So xk that I'm turning on is necessarily positive right, because I ha it has to satisfy the constraint that all x's are positive. So I can decrease the value of the cost function only if the coefficient which multiplies xk in this equation is negative. So this coefficient is called reduced cost. So it depends on k. Now we have the following uh, we have the following problem. So given the initial vertex, I have to go. I have to check all the other points k, all the other all the other indices k, and find one which has a negative reduced cost. So if there is no index k for which the reduced cost is negative, then it means that I reached the minimum. I cannot reduce the cost of by moving in any direction. So then, then it's the absolute minimum of my problem. If on the other hand, there is K for which this quantity is negative, uh, then you can, uh, for example, choose the index for which this, qu this quantity is most negative, and then you would decrease the cost function as rapidly as possible. So peak, so let's assume the second possibility is realized, so peak, uh, k star for which uh, uh, this quantity is negative. So now you so you pick this you pick this value and you start increasing x k. You start increasing x k and you as you increase x k, your cost function is going down, but x b changes. It changes according to this formula. And so you increase xk until one of the components of xb hits zero. So initially when you start at your when you start at your iteration, all components of xb were positive. That was the definition of xb, it was a basic variable. So as you increase xk, at some point one of them 
is going to hit zero. So increase, so peak k star, so it's negative, and then uh, increase xk until uh, one of the components of xb hits zero. When this happens, you can no longer increase xk because if you if you keep increasing it more, then you will violate one of these inequalities. But then, what does it mean that one of the components of x s b x b became zero? What does it mean geometrically? Sorry. Exactly. It means that you arrive to another vertex. It means that you arrive to another vertex. And at the new vertex, the list of basic variables is changed because now the variable which hits zero, it leaves the list of basic variables and the variable k enters the list of basic variables. And so this is the, uh, so then it means that you reached a new vertex. And so that's the end of the iteration of the simplex method. And then you just keep going. You keep going until you until you reach the absolute minimum. So that's how uh, that's how it works, and uh, it works fast. Any questions about this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, you you want to do this minimization. There are several reasons why you want to do the minimization. So one reason is that, as we will see in a while, uh, it's sometimes interesting not only to find a solution to the uh, to the bootstrap equations, but also to find a solution which satisfies some minimality properties, like, for example, which has the minimal possible central charge. And then, by doing this minimization, you will not only find a solution, but you will find a solution with the minimal possible central charge. So that's nice. Another reason is that I'm going to show now that uh, the problem of, fi of deciding existence of a single solution can also be... Because, you see, here I had to assume that somebody gave me the initial vertex. And now I have to, uh, I have to show you that that uh, I have to show you how to solve that problem yet, and to solve that problem, uh, it's important to have this freedom, as you will see in a second. So let me let me then erase this. Well, if since we have, since we have n much larger than m, that problem is going to have infinitely many solutions, and uh, you will still have then to sieve through all those solutions to find that there is any one of them which satisfies this constraint. It's not going to be efficient. You have to take to keep track from this constraint from the very beginning, otherwise it's going to be extremely un inefficient. So, so the problem of finding an initial vertex. So, so here the idea is that construct, construct an auxiliary problem. So given this problem, given this problem, forget for the moment, uh, forget, for, forget for the moment about this minimization part. You know, given this, given this problem, I'm going to construct 
an auxiliary problem where I will, I will include, include uh, m more variable, which I will call uh, which I will call y i, so y ver i variables. And my auxiliary problem is going to be this, x i positive uh, y j, sorry, it's going to be y j. y j is also going to be positive, and the constraint is going to be different. So I'm going, the constraint is going to be x a x, uh, okay, the component j of a x plus uh, B J Y J here's no sum has to be equal to B J for uh, for J equals one to M. So so why did I do this? Well, because this auxiliary problem has clearly an initial vertex. So it clearly has a solution. This auxiliary problem clearly has a solution. And the solution to this auxiliary problem is given by, so this clearly has, uh, clearly has a solution. And the solution is given by equal to zero and all y are equal to one. a trivial solution. But now I'm going to take this trivial solution and I'm going to impose that I would like to minimize the sum of yj so I'm going to start from this trivial solution and I'm going to minimize the sum of yj so all yj is positive so the minimum uh, of this problem is either zero or it's a positive number. If it's zero, it means that I eliminated all yj's and it means that I found an initial vertex for this problem. If on the other hand I find that the minimum to this problem is positive, is strictly positive, it means that it's impossible, it's, it's impossible to eliminate y's and it means that this problem that I considered here isn't consistent. And this was the original problem that I, I wanted to solve, whether this problem is consistent or not. So if, uh, if this minimum is zero, then we get initial vertex, vertex for the original problem. otherwise uh, inconsistent. Okay. Be well, because you see, I have to find, uh, for each component of the vector B, I have to add a variable y to reproduce precisely that component. So the number of y's is equal to the number of equations. I mean, th this term, well, because uh, this is just a question of normalization, because then I want the coefficients in my cost function to be all equal to one. I could, I could choose here a different coefficient, but then uh, the cost function would be different. Yeah, there is some freedom here. You are right, but it's just a choice that I made. Uh, you are right, but uh, that would be, uh, yeah, if, if all components of this B vector were positive, then you were right. But if, if some of them are negative, then I want my variables Y to be positive in order to, uh, to fit the, uh, 
the general structure of the math. Otherwise, you're totally right. Yeah, if, if you allow for negative y's, then we could we could do like you're saying. So I think it's a, it's a useful piece of linear algebra. In fact, uh, you know, in, li in linear algebra courses, we are usually taught how to solve systems of linear equations. But in fact, the truth is that solving linear inequalities is not much harder than solving linear equations. So it's, it's good to know uh, uh, that, that this can be easily solved as well. Okay, uh, so that's all I wanted to say about the simplex method. And now I can go to show you some of the results which can be obtained, uh, some of the numerical results which can be obtained using this, uh, using this uh, technique. I already showed you last time uh, some uh, toy results which you could get with very little numerical work. So I'm now going to show you some results uh, which you get with more numerical work uh, the kind of state-of-the-art results. And there's going to be uh, uh, two sets of results. So one set of results is going to be uh, the ones which are for, uh, for single correlator, the ones that we were discussing before. And then I will discuss what you can do if you put together several correlation functions. So... Uh <coughs> So this is a two-dimensional plot. So this is a plot uh, of the conformal block of the conformal bootstrap analysis in two-dimensional conformal field theories. So it's precisely in the setup that I was discussing. So on the horizontal axis, I I take I vary delta phi, the dimension of the external operator, and on the vertical axis, I vary the gap for in this in the scalar sector. And uh, what this plot shows, uh, you know, and here you see several curves. Uh, as I vary the number of derivatives that I include, you know, from 6 up to 28 derivatives, uh, you, uh, you see that, uh, what you see here is that we have a bound. So the, ga the gap cannot be arbitrary. You know, the, the gap for any value of delta phi, there is a maximal allowed gap. So if the gap is above this curve, then using this method, you can show that there is no solution, that this system is inconsistent and there is no unitary conformal field theory which has this value of the gap. And so, uh, so last time we were, we were fixing delta phi equals to uh, one eighth to precisely the Ising model and we were deriving the gap at this point, and we got something like 1.04. Here I'm, I'm repeating the same analysis for any value of delta phi in this range from 0 to 0.3, and you know, I'm pushing the numerics to include more and more derivatives. Uh, and as you see, I get, uh, I get, uh, I get a bound which has uh, a very interesting feature. So it has several interesting features. So the first feature that, that, that you see is that the, the two-dimensional easing point, which is this point, you know, the dimension of, of the operator in the two-dimensional easing is 1, 1, 8, really uh, stands out in this plot. So it stands out as a, as a sort of corner point of the allowed region. So... Um, so if you wish, if you, if you didn't know about the existence of the two-dimensional easy model, you could make this plot and you could see, well, this is a really interesting point down here. It's a corner point. So something interesting must go on there. And this way you would discover the two-dimensional easy model. Uh, there are other some interesting points in this plot, like th these points uh, here, here, here. They all correspond to some scalar operators which exist in other minimal model conformal field theories. So the, the Ising model is just the first conformal field theory in an infinite series of unitary minimal models. And all these minimal models also saturate this bound. Uh, 
so so this is pretty interesting already and um, so when we did this analysis in 2009 for the first time then of course uh, the the idea which uh, comes to your mind is whether something similar happens also in three dimensions whether you could also isolate the three-dimensional easy model using a similar sort of, of analysis. So any questions about this plot? Uh, you mean all the points on the boundary? Uh, well, in fact, we know that no, not all points on this boundary correspond to unitary CFTs. But here, you see, here we are looking on just one correlation function out of infinitely many. So you would be surprised to get the full information just from one correlation function. So this is a very rough analysis. And you know what you expect is that by including more and more correlation functions, then uh, this region is going to go away, and there are going to be some islands which surround the allowed points, and the rest is just going to disappear. So that's, that's kind of the hope. You will see later on that this hope is, is realized in a sense. My interpretation. Well, first of all, I see that uh, uh, the numerical bounds do not contradict uh, what we already know about unitary CFTs. If, for example, the easing model were to lie here, then I would say, well, then clearly my method is, is wrong because it excludes a theory which we know exists, right? So, so we do not exclude here anything that we know for sure exists. That's one interpretation. A second interpretation is that mysteriously some theories which you know exist, they end up on the boundary of the allowed region. It's because uh, we know that minimal models are very special, very, uh, you know, they have a lot of structure in them. And uh, uh, this uh, kind of analysis, it just adds to the list of special properties of the minimal models. They, c they can be singled out by maximizing the gap in the scalar operator spectrum. Just another special property of the minimal models. Any other questions? I'm keeping, uh, you mean, these discretization parameters and so on? Well, in this analysis, actually, I mean, there is a way to do the analysis where you don't discretize. I did not, uh, I did not explain this, but basically here there is no discretization. In the end, you get, in the end, the number of operators that you get in your solution is equal to the number of derivatives. Because as, as I say, in the end, uh, you know, if you put m equations, then in the end, only m of these variables are going to be non-zero. So in order to, s to find a solution, there are going to be m operators. Actually, the number of, th this, this is a, uh, this bound 28, it's on the sum of alpha plus beta. So the number of derivatives grows quadratically with lambda. So you have order 100 operators in the solution. Uh, so that lower bound is is uh, out of this here. It's in the negative, so it's not plotted here. But there's going to be another lower bound, which is more impressive. Okay, so in uh, in 2012 we uh, we did this analysis for the three-dimensional case, uh, and uh, you see this was for 78. So we're including 78 equations. And we discovered, as, uh, as we initially thought, that indeed uh, the three-dimensional easy model stands out also in this plot. So here, here I'm, it's the same analysis. So sigma is just the, phi, the phi. So phi in the easy model is the spin field. We call it sigma. And epsilon is the 
energy operator in, in which is the first operator in the loop E sigma times sigma. So sigma times sigma equals one plus epsilon plus dot 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 plus infinitely many other fields. And it's known that uh, the sigma operator in, in the two-dimensional easing model has dimension approximately 518 and the epsilon operator has dimension approximately 1.41. It's known from RG, from Monte Carlo simulations. And in this algorithm, which is completely different from any other method that, that was applied up to now, completely orthogonal, we found this corner point, which was mysteriously located at precisely the same uh, location. So, th so this was just uh, an indication that something is going on here, but apart from the indication, there was a rigorous result that all points in this region are allowed and all points in this region would be forbidden by, by conformal symmetry. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Then a priori, you would, it could be anywhere, could be anywhere. Because the only thing which this plot assumes is the conformal symmetry and Z2 invariance. And the crossing symmetry, of course, yeah, with the consequence of conformal symmetry. So, mm, and 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 then uh, there was another interesting property of of, of the three-dimensional easy model that we discovered. So, uh, as I said, it's useful to have it's useful to have this uh, this ability to minimize because then you can uh, you can not only look for a solution to crossing symmetry, but you can look for a solution where some particular OP coefficient is uh, either minimal or maximal. And it, in particular, it's very interesting to look at the OP coefficient of the stress tensor operator because the, the OP coefficient of the stress tensor operator appropriately normalized, it goes like one over square root of the center of charge. So this is something I did not explain, but let me just let me just uh, uh, you know take this for granted and so if you maximize if you maximize this op coefficient or minimize its negative then you are essentially minimizing the center of charge and it's known it's a known fact that in two dimensions the the me the easing model has the smallest possible center of charge out of all unitary conformal field theories. So we uh, then decided to see whether something similar is, uh, is, is, is true also for the three-dimensional easy model. So we said, let us minimize the center of charge or maximize the SOP coefficient. What are we going to get? Well, we... Uh, this, is, this is basically a definition that... Uh, it is a definition. So the, the more precise definition is that because of the word identities, the stress tensor is going to appear in any for any operator sigma. Uh, it's going to appear with a coefficient which is going to go like the dimension of sigma divided by center charge. So if you if you now pick another another uh, operator, like if you take now epsilon times epsilon, then uh, it's going to contain delta epsilon divided by center charge. So. So with one coefficient, you fix infinitely many OP coefficients in 3D. This is still uh, pretty restrictive. Yeah, that's why there's a strange, uh, there's a strange uh, normalization here. Um, so, so what we discovered is that, yes, it's true that, that uh, there is this, this curve for the center charge has a minimum uh, precisely at the same location as the the three-dimensional easing model. And this minimum is indeed smaller by a few percent, five percent or so, 
than the center charge of the free scalar theory. So in, in two dimensions, the easing mole has center charge one half, while the free scalar theory has center charge one. Uh, so it's, it's a lot smaller. But in three dimensions, it's just by 5% smaller than, than the free scalar theory we discovered. Uh, and, uh, well, these were suggestive results, but, uh, you know, we, we were thinking about how to push these results to get some precision. And eventually, uh, what we did in, uh, in, in 2014, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not giving any references to my collaborators, but you can find them in, in my lecture notes. So we decided that this uh, method of center charge, which we call C-minimization, is the, the most convenient method to zoom in on this uh, three-dimensional easing model point. So by, uh, by pushing the number of derivatives to, I mean, to 251 derivatives, we were able to localize this minimal, this minimum of this curve, the center charge curve, better and better. And eventually, uh, it became so small, this minimum, that by extracting the value of, uh, of the uh, sigma dimension from the position of the minimum, you know, there are several curves here depending on how many derivatives you include, we were able to extract the dimension of sigma with a bunch of digits and the center charge with a lot of digits. And in addition to this, there was this uh, property that if you really want to live at this minimum point in this curve, then uh, it turns out that the solution of this crossing symmetry at the middle point is essentially unique. So if you fix sigma here and the center charge here, then not only sigma and the center charge get fixed, but also all the other operators in the OPE, all these infinitely many operators, they have to adjust themselves to precise positions in order to realize the minimum. So in particular, you can also, even though this plot only refers to sigma and the center charge, you are also able to fix the dimension of the epsilon operator and the OPE coefficient of the epsilon operator very precisely, because if they do not take this, these numbers, if they do not take these values, then uh, basically your solution is disturbed and you no longer realize the minimal center of charge. Uh, this is equivalent to, yeah, this is, let me take this as a definition of C in 3D. Well, if it were just one equation, that would not be very interesting. The, the, uh, the, the interesting part is that with one parameter C, you fix the OPE coefficient of T mu nu in any OPE. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, 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 l l let me not go into this. So the point is that there is some natural definition of C, you know, when in two dimensions there are many definitions of C, only one of those extends to 3D. So let's take the one which extends. I'm telling you that with this definition, uh, we have this fact that the easy model has the minimal possible center charge. The three-dimensional easy model seems to have, so I did not show you this yet, right? This is still based on a plausible but an unproven assumption that the three-dimensional easy model has the smallest possible center charge of all unitary CFTs, right? Because a priori it could live anywhere above this curve. But what I'm, what I'm conjecturing here is that actually it lives at the minimum. And if you buy this conjecture, uh, then you can, um, you can extract these uh, very precise predictions about 
the parameters of the three-dimensional easy model CFT. So uh, I think I have to make a break, but let's make it a short break. And then after the break, I'll talk about the, the multiple correlators. So what you can learn more uh, with multiple correlators and not with a single correlator. Yeah, let's make a break. Let's make a five minute break, not a very long break. So I'm resuming in, uh, in five minutes. So what about multiple correlators? What about other correlators? Mm. For example, suppose that you are interested in the three-dimensional easy model. And so far, we studied this. You know, I discussed the constraints that you get by studying uh, four-point function of, of the lowest dimension z to odd operator sigma. But there's also this operator epsilon that, you know, we actually prove that the three-dimensional easy model necessarily contains this operator. And then you say, well, uh, what about, you know, sh shouldn't I consider together, let me consider together several three-point functions, several together. So this is a natural thing to do because, uh, you know, th these are the only two relevant scalar operators that the three-dimensional easy model has. So, you know, given that the relevant scalar operators are the most interesting and the most uh, uh, phenomenologically relevant operators, it's nice, it would be nice to study them uh, together. And you may suspect already that by doing this, you are going to, uh, to learn more than by studying just one correlator. And the reason is the following. So if, if we study the correlator sigma times sigma, then the only OPE you are sensitive to is the OPE sigma times sigma, uh, which has the following structure we discussed. It has the unit operator, plus it has an operator epsilon, and let me call its coefficient f sigma sigma epsilon. Then it contains uh, it contains a stress tensor, and the coefficient of this is equal to delta sigma over over c. But now suppose that we also add to this list an OPE. Uh, yeah, and by the way, it contains epsilon, but it also you know it may contain other scalars, but uh, other scalars. Uh, like epsilon prime, which was going to be the first, uh, the second uh, Z2 even scalar, uh, it necessarily, so there are other scales, but they are all irrelevant. So constraint that these other scalars are irrelevant can be easily incorporated in the conformal bootstrap I described. Because remember, I was saying that we are making this we are making this assumption that uh, that the spectrum of scalars starts at some dimension delta zero, and then I was allowing all other operators above delta zero. But there's no reason to do this. I can say, well, this my delta zero is going to be delta epsilon, and then I'm going to assume that all other operators have dimension bigger than three. As we know that all the other operators are irrelevant. So we can impose, instead of allowing them to start right above epsilon, I'm going to allow them to start uh, only from three. So this is easy, this is easy to do. Now let us go to the OP epsilon times epsilon. So epsilon times epsilon is again going to contain unit operator plus operator epsilon with some other coefficient, which we don't know. Uh, by the way, in in the two-dimensional easy model, this coefficient is exactly zero because of the uh, Kramer's Vanier duality. But in the three-dimensional easy model, it's not zero. So again, plus other scalars. Uh, 
which are irrelevant. And the stress tensor is going to occur in this OPE with the coefficient uh, precisely related to the coefficient of the stress tensor in the first OPE. So if, if I fix the central charge from the first OPE and this OPE coefficient, then I know automatically the coefficient of the stress tensor in the second OPE. This is just by the word identity. So, uh, so this is an example of how by putting several OPEs in together, I can leverage constraining power. So now I have two different OPEs, but the OPE coefficients are precisely related. So uh, other things. But now let me consider the third OPE. So I'm going to, to be sensitive to this third OPE if I study this correlation function, the last one, sigma, sigma, epsilon, epsilon. So this OPE is not going to contain the unit operator because it's an OPE of two not identical scalars. So it will start from operator sigma. So here I'm considering OPE of Z2 odd operator and Z2 even operator. So by the Z2 symmetry, it will contain only Z2 odd operators and the first of them is sigma. So that's, that's nice. Uh, this operator is going to occur in this OPE with precisely the same coefficient as the coefficient of epsilon in the first OPE. So it's precisely the same coefficient. Why is that? Exactly. So this coefficient is, is the same coefficient as in the three-point function, and it's the same three-point function sigma sigma epsilon. So, so you see, once again, we have this crosstalk. So if you study one OPE and the other, they, they, they will talk to each other. So it's interesting to study them together. Then uh, you have other scalars, which are Z2 odd which are again irrelevant. Uh, plus, uh, yeah, plus you have all the other fields that you have to include here. Mm. And you can already, you can already kind of foresee why this OPE is going to be very particularly interesting for the bootstrap because uh, the operator sigma has a, has a low dimension. It has dimension one half. Well, 0.518 and so above this operator there's going to be a very big gap so from one half the next operator that you're going to, to be allowed to include is going to be irrelevant so it will have dimension larger than three so you have a big gap from one half to three this gap is going to be even larger than the gap that we have in in the sigma times sigma p because here epsilon has dimension 1.4, so you have a, a gap from 1.4 to 3. At least, in fact, it, at least from 1.4 to 3. Because you don't know yet, we don't know yet what is the dimension of these irrelevant scalar operators. So, as I say, it's clear, I mean, it was clear from, uh, from the start, if you manage to study them together, then this is going to be very, very constraining and very, very interesting. Uh, and, uh, but there was a technical reason. There was a technical problem uh, which made it not obvious how to study them together. And this technical problem was related to this, uh, to th to this third four-point function. So this first, the second four-point function is of precisely the same type as the one we already discussed. It's four identical scalar operators. But this one is, is, is of a new, is of a qualitatively new type. So what is the difference here? The difference is that, uh, so when, when we study the crossing symmetry for this, uh, this uh, four-point function, we can basically do it in two different ways. So... For example, we can, we can start by considering the OPE of these two operators, sigma and epsilon, and these two operators, sigma and epsilon. 
So this is one way to, to write a decomposition for this four-point function. And, but then we can do it in the opposite order. So this is one way. And the other way would be to take the OP of this sigma with this epsilon and of this sigma with this epsilon. This, uh, this would be one constraint. And this constraint would involve coefficients, OP coefficients of f, sigma, epsilon, and some other operator, which I'll call k. And since both of these OPEs are sigma, epsilon, something, this is going to be f, sigma, epsilon, k squared. So this uh, OPE analysis, this conformal block, uh, conformal bootstrap analysis, will involve once again, squares of OP coefficients, which are positive numbers. So it would be similar to what we discussed so far. But now let's take it. Let's take a different ordering. Suppose that you want to compare this OP to this one. Here we have a problem because when you do the OP of sigma sigma with something and epsilon epsilon with something, then here we will have uh, the OP coefficient f sigma sigma k times f epsilon epsilon k. And this number, it can be positive or negative. We don't know anything about the sign of this number. So then the question uh, becomes, so if you want to, uh, to have the full constraining power of conformal bootstrap for this correlator, then we have to, to come up with some smart idea how to deal with this, uh, with this uh, product of two peak coefficients, which is not sign definite. So in other words, uh, let me, uh, you, can, you can formulate this uh, even more uh, generally. So if you, have, if you have four different fields, I, J, K, L, uh, well let me call them phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4. And if you write a conformal block decomposition for this correlator, then this will involve the products of OP coefficients f1 to k, f3, 4k. And so uh, this shows that in general, uh, conformal bootstrap equations are quadratic constraints on the OP coefficients. They will they are quadratic constraints on the OP coefficients. And when we were focusing on uh, correlators of identical scalars, we basically took advantage of the fact that, yeah, there's a quadratic constraint, but there's a quadratic constraints involving squares of coefficients. So you can rewrite it as linear constraints on the squares of OP coefficients. And so then we were able to use these linear programming methods, which are specifically designed for linear problems. Now, at this correlator sigma, sigma, epsilon, epsilon, where for the first time, we, are, we have to face up to the problem that, well, Yes, conformal bootstrap is a quadratic, is a quadratic constraint, not a linear constraint. And uh, so you you have to, mm, yeah, you have to think about it. You would uh, learn something more, but it I think it would not be as dramatic as the results that I'm going to show. Would be as dramatic, yeah. So, uh, so this is this was a basic problem, and uh, you know you can uh, you can write this problem also in the following language. You can say, well, uh, so we have these OP coefficients sigma sigma k and epsilon epsilon k, and if you study the uh, the bootstrap for this correlator and this correlator you are dealing with the same OP coefficients, but squares of them. So we have, let me call it xk equals f uh, sigma sigma k squared, which is a positive number, yk equals f 
epsilon epsilon k squared, which is again a positive number, and then zk is f sigma sigma k, uh, f epsilon epsilon k, and we know we don't know anything about the sign of this number, but the only thing we know is that uh, is that um, uh, zk squared is equal no absolute value of zk is equal to uh, square root of xk yk we know this but you know the this constraint is a highly nonlinear constraint so you cannot like take linear programming code and impose on it that your variable zk have to satisfy this constraint uh, this, the code is not going to be uh, to be able to work. So you, you have to find another way. And uh, uh, one way that uh, was found was, I mean, you could throw out this constraint altogether, but then you would lose predictive power. So we, we cannot do this. So we have to replace this constraint by some other constraint which is slightly more manageable. So what would that constraint be? It turns out that uh, a good constraint is uh, Z. So instead of imposing exact equality, let us impose that uh, it's, let's, imp let's replace the equality by inequality. Z less than X times Y. So this, this of course, not as constraining, but this has this inequality has a very 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 important advantage so the advantage is that this constraint is convex actually a convex cone So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have, so let's consider uh, a collection of three points, X, Y, Z. Let me call it, uh, let me call M a collection of three points, X, one, Z. And let's take, uh, let's take, I mean, one thing which is true is that if you have a collection of three points which satisfies this constraint, then if you multiply it by any positive number, then you will also get a solution. You will also get something which satisfies this constraint because because this constraint sta scales uh, alpha just scales out for any alpha. This is a triviality. Uh, a slightly uh, less trivial but still simple fact is that if you have two collections. Uh, of numbers m1 and m2 which satisfy this constraint then m1 plus m2 their sum is also going to satisfy this constraint and that's why it's called the convex cone so this is a, a convexity condition that, that that you can take a sum well the, the convexity would be if you take a half sum that would be a convexity condition and uh, the fact that you can multiply uh, by a positive number, this is a cone condition. So the set of all uh, uh, of all collections of x, y, z by this constraint uh, forms a convex cone. And uh, and there is a simple. We I mean, there is like a a direct way to see it just by dealing with this inequality. But there is a smarter way to see this, uh, which uh, which is as follows. Let's take this uh, collection and let's write a matrix M equals X, Y, Z, Z. And so I have conditions X positive, X, Y positive, and Z less than square root of X, Y. So th this condition that z is less than square root of x, y means the determinant of this matrix is positive. 
And the fact that x and y are positive means that the trace of this matrix is also positive. So it means that both eigenvalues of this matrix are positive. So this matrix M is positive semi-definite. As we say. And so and, and the positiveness definiteness condition can be rewritten as you know as, as the fact that the C at that C transpose M C is non negative for any C. This is the condition for positiveness semi definiteness. And this condition written in this form, it's completely obvious that you have two matrices M one and M two which satisfy this condition, then their sum then their arbitrary linear combination with positive coefficients will also satisfy this condition. Right? So, so positive semi-definite matrices form the set of positive semi-definite matrices of any dimension is a highly nonlinear manifold, but it's a convex manifold. It's a convex cone. Actually, this is a Th this is probably the most famous uh, non-trivial convex set. It's a very famous uh, set in convex geometry, the set of all uh, positive semi-definite matrices. <coughs> and so, uh, any questions about, about this? And so basically we have... Uh, we have the following we have the following fact that if you have multiple correlator bootstrap Actually, this is true for any number of correlators, not just for, for three correlators. Then you can write it, uh, so it, you can reduce the multiple correlator bootstrap to a problem of, of the kind sum over i uh, x i delta L. Well, let's say, no, sorry, uh, let me call this index uh, A. Uh, sum over delta L x A delta L some vectors, uh, no, sorry, no, no, let me use, no, let me use, uh, uh, let me use uh, row, row delta L. Then here I have A uh, row, so row is just an index, uh, delta L equals B row. And row uh, runs from one to the number of correlators that you're studying. <coughs> uh, where, uh, where these variables x row, uh, they have to satisfy positiveness, po positive semi-definiteness constraint. By this I mean that uh, that uh, these variables you you group them in some matrices. So you write down these constraints, uh, th these equations, and then you you write down some matrices which are built out of these variables x row, and you impose that those matrices have to be so these variables have to be chosen so that those matrices are positive semi-definite. So something like you know you write M equals uh, x one. Uh, this is just an example. So example M, you write M equals X1, X2, X3, X2. You write M delta L equals X1 delta L, X2 delta L. And you impose that this has to be positive semi-definite for any delta and L. So c constraints of this type. <coughs> and uh, so, so you see, uh, for single correlator bootstrap, we just had constraint that this coefficient have to be positive. Now this positiveness constraint get replaced by positive semi-definiteness constraint. 
But as I said, the positive semi-definiteness constraint is convex. And as you remember, for the simplex method, this convexity was very important because it, it allowed us to, uh, to conclude, for example, that the minimum for the problems that we are considering, they had a, a unique minimum. So you cannot get trapped in a local minimum. The global minimum is unique. So similarly here, this, the set of solutions to this constraint, if it's not empty, is convex. And if you have to minimize any function on this set, the minimum, as long as it's a convex function, the minimum is going to be unique. And uh, so you cannot use the simplex method. The simplex method for this problem is not going to work because, uh, so this set is convex, but its boundary has some very complicated nonlinear structure, nonlinear non -linear shape. So this set is convex, but, you know, for the simplex method, the boundary was uh, was polygonal, so you could just move from one vertex to the other. Here, the boundary is curved. You cannot move along the boundary. It's very complicated. So the way, uh, so the subject of solving this sort of problems is called semi-definite programming. There are efficient algorithms to solve this kind of problems. So I'm not going to discuss them because this would uh, is, a, is a technical subject. And uh, if you want, <coughs> you can read about them in, uh, in this paper uh, that I'm going to, uh, to give you the number. So it's a physics paper. Of course, there's mathematics literature, but this is a, a for physicists, this is a good. And the crucial difference between these algorithms and the simplex method is that these are the so-called interior point interior point algorithms meaning that you know you, as I said you cannot move along the boundary the boundary is complicated so what you are trying to do is you are trying to approach the boundary you are trying to approach the minimum while staying always inside the allowed set by a series of steps moving inside the allowed step Any questions about about this? And now, what can you do with this? So let me now show you. Uh, let me now show you the the results that were obtained by these methods. <coughs> so this is a mm, this is the first result. So it's so this is the plot which comes out if you take this technology and you apply it to the bootstrap analysis of three correlation functions in the three-dimensional easy model. So it's, uh, you impose you take uh, sigma, 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 epsilon, 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 and sigma, sigma, epsilon, epsilon, and you impose that uh, sigma and epsilon are the only relevant scalars. There's no separate definition of epsilon. In this approach, Epsilon is defined as the lowest dimension scalar appearing in the OPE sigma times sigma. The lowest dimension and the only one below three, because you impose that any other operator should have dimension larger than three. Why is this an assumption? There is a way to prove. I mean, it's an experimental fact because since. Uh, because it's, it follows from the fact that the, the phase diagram of water has only two variables, right? Yeah, yeah. No, if you wish, yeah. So, 
I mean, strictly speaking, I'm just studying CFT, which has the two symmetry and a certain assumption about the number of realm pairs. The question of identifying that CFT with the three-dimensional easing model is not the task for the conformal field theory. As usual, it's always like, suppose you do uh, in two dimensions, you do minimal models, and you found the minimal model which has operators one half, one eight, and one. How do you know it's a two-dimensional easy model? Well, you have to do an additional calculation to, to conclude that. Either exact solution or you, you have to do something, but CFT does not tell you that. Same here. Well, I'm assuming that two symmetry. So sigma times sigma uh, equals one plus epsilon plus uh, anything uh, above three uh, is not an assumption. It's followed follows from this and this. This coefficient could be zero, right? I, I'm not assuming that it's positive. It could be zero. So it's my analysis which allows me, in, which tells me in the end that it's not zero. So it's not an extra assumption. Yeah, yeah, so epsilon, it's the same P as I was, write, I was writing here. So, <coughs> so I'm allowing epsilon epsilon equals one plus epsilon with, with some arbitrary coefficient here plus anything above three. No, it's not zero. In, two, in 3D, it's not zero. 3D is not zero. <coughs> so, so what do you find here? Uh, so uh, you discover that it is this constraint. So it is sigma, sigma, epsilon, epsilon, which is the killer. Because as I said, of this huge gap that we assume in the the OPE sigma times epsilon. So you can try to impose these constraints one by one. So you, you, you start like the, the plot that I was showing before, which is this dashed curve. Right, this was the bound. Then you say, well, let me assume that uh, there is a gap above epsilon up to three. Well, a small portion of this curve go, goes away. N not much, nothing much dramatic happens. But then you, you know, you assume also that epsilon, equ epsilon equals one plus epsilon plus eight. Well, a small little part of the curve goes away, but again, nothing dramatic. Then you impose this sigma times epsilon equals sigma with, again, you, you can assume that the coefficient is exactly the same as here or, or not the same. But the moment you assume the gap, then most of this region goes away and there's left a small island here around the easing mole point plus this other region which is disconnected and uh, okay this region it keeps moving away as you increase the number of derivatives while this island shrinks and becomes smaller and smaller as you increase the number of derivatives so um, so that's what uh, Philip Koss, David Paul, and David Simmons Duffin discovered two years ago. Any, any questions? Any further questions about this? Yeah, so exactly. So first they discovered this island, and then uh, David Simmons Duffin pushed, uh, you know, the as I said, here there is this field of semi-definite programming and there were some algorithms, there are some programs for using semi-definite programming uh, that uh, they were using, but those programs were not optimized for the sort of problems which were needed in the conformal bootstrap. And so David Simmons Duffin here wrote an optimized solver for semi-definite programming and with this optimized solver, he managed to push uh, to such a high derivative order that this island that that was still pretty big here uh, it you know it basically kept shrinking until it shrunk so uh, 
it became so small that uh, you know he was able to determine delta sigma and delta epsilon with uh, with very many digits. And you know in this plot you see this. so this is basically the only allowed region which is um, which is left. And in the same plot uh, you see what was the best Monte Carlo prediction at the time. Uh, so it's consistent with Monte Carlo. It's it's also consistent with C minimization. So uh, it's not shown here, but C minimization is something like that. The regions of C minimization. So, so it's it's consistent, but more precise than the C minimization. So post facto, it also justifies the the C, minimiza C minimization. Uh, and uh, well, that's that's where it all led. And uh, I hear now that they managed to push this. Uh, a bit, uh, a bit more, and uh, determine a few more digits uh, in this uh, values of delta sigma and delta epsilon. So it looks like if you push the numerics, then uh, this island keeps getting smaller and smaller. So I, I think it's is, it, is this the last plot that I yeah this is the last plot that I wanted to show. Um, so that these are basically the state of the art results and. Uh, Mm, I um, to wrap up. I just wanted to do uh, to give you a couple of papers for further reading. Because you see, the, the easing wall was sort of the uh, the highlight of activity because since since it's been. Uh, since it's so widely known, uh, you know, it was like the benchmark to benchmark the methods. Uh, we were doing this for the EasyMall, but uh, but there's nothing special about the EasyMall. You can do exactly the same. People did exactly the same technology applied it to the OAN models, and they discovered exactly the same sort of islands. So it's called o OAN Archipelago. So for each value of n and equal uh, one, two, three, uh, there is a CFT, and there is a s an island in which that CFT lives. So it's just slightly away from uh, from the easing model island. So you get a collection of islands, and so this uh, you can read in this paper. Uh, and uh, there was also very interesting work about uh, about uh, 3D fermions. So, uh, 3D or two plus one dimensional fermions, where uh, they were. Mm, uh, so there are some interesting CFTs in two plus one dimension which contain fermionic operators. Uh, like uh, like the gross niveau model, for example, and uh, uh, you can apply the bootstrap. So I was discussing all the scalar operators and the operators of integer spin, but you can apply uh, the bootstrap also to correlation function of Fermi operator. So there's some you have to pay attention to size, and uh, and this was done in this, part in this paper <coughs> also last year, where. Uh, Uh, where uh, they're not, uh, they they have not yet found the islands, so they just found some very small, uh, finely shaped regions. Uh, but you know, it's conceivable that also in that case, some islands are going to be found. And yeah. Oh no no, these are strongly coupled. Strong, uh, you mean they? Uh, yeah, for free fermions, it's kind of, it's not worth the trouble. Yeah, no, of course you 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 find some exclusion plots, and of course uh, free fermions, they uh, they satisfy your constraints, of course, unless you impose some constraint about the gap which excludes them. But then there are other solutions which are which correspond to strongly coupled fixed points, like with some. So the the, the particular case they studied were the. In my run of fermions in, in two plus one dimension. 
And that's it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of activity where people take uh, take their favorite CFT, like for example, three-dimensional uh, QED coupled to a certain number of fermions, and uh, you keep you pick your favorite operator in that CFT, like uh, you like uh, a fermion bilinear, or maybe you like a monopole operator, and then you study its four-point function and you see what does conformal uh, symmetry have to say about the dimension of this operator, uh, and uh, uh, you always find some constraint. Uh, in some cases, that constraint is remarkably strong. In other cases, it's not as strong. And so it's an open problem in the field is, um, you know, to understand why, why in some cases you get so much mileage out of so little effort. Uh, so... I mean, it's a new technique, so people are still coming to grips with their how to use it best. Yeah, four dimensions, six dimensions, any number of dimensions. People try all, all sorts of things. Supersymmetry, uh, yeah. all sorts of things. Uh, Uh, it depends on the, on, on, on the amount of supersymmetry. So if you assume little supersymmetry, then it doesn't do much. If you assume a lot of supersymmetry, then there was some very interesting work uh, because uh, so in, in without supersymmetry or with little supersymmetry, most of the progress was numerical. But with a lot of supersymmetry, uh, you discover some exactly solvable subsectors of this conformal bootstrap equation, which were just like a new type of protected information, which is not of the type that people uh, were discussing before. So it's no, you, you like find you like find uh, well. The precise technical result is that in in any theory which has n equal to supersymmetry in four dimensions uh, if you it contains an exactly solvable subsector which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the two-dimensional chiral algebra and so in this subsector the bootstrap equation is a, can be exactly solved and there is a uh, and so by doing this, you, you learn already some things about this, this CFT, supersymmetric CFT that people didn't know. Uh, so y you learn a lot about protected operators, and then uh, if you want to learn about unprotected operators, then you have to do numerics again. So that's the state of the art. So if you have any CFT, so the, the key for this technique is that you have, a, you have to have a sharply formulated question. Like... Uh, you know, these are two operators and uh, these are their dimensions. Can it be, can it happen or can it not happen? If you have a sharply formulated question, then uh, this technique is ideal to get a rigorous yes or no answer. If you don't have a formulated question, then, then, uh, um, then it's not so clear how to proceed. No, we are not. We don't need to make this assumption, right? So, uh, it's a natural conjecture to make. I mean, given given these results, given these absurdly small islands, it's a very natural uh, conjecture to make that probably there is just one CFT there, and it's definitely uh, also consistent with the RG intuition that there is only one uh, critical point, only one universality class. Perhaps following this logic, this can be proven one day. But this has not been done yet. A good question, yeah. It's not known. I mean, what is known is that if you were to impose more and more and more conformal bootstrap constraints, then sure, probably at some point you would have, you would see some island emerge. 
but why does it emerge while imposing only three correlation functions? That's, uh, that's unexpected, that's completely unexpected. Because to fix a CFT, you would naively think you have to impose infinitely many constraints or for infinitely many correlation functions. Here we are imposing just three correlation functions and yet we get this absurdly small island. Why? Uh, you know, it's anyone's guess at this point. Uh, well, there's in three dimensions. There is no tricritical idling. Uh, yeah, you could. Yeah, it would be just a game because because it's not. Uh, well, tricritical island has different dimensions, right? You would just discover a different island uh, with different dimensions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really, I mean, whatever you're going to propose, uh, it's probably a, an interesting avenue for, for research here, because this, uh, uh, this, is, this is pretty new. There is order, I mean, it's not like topological uh, story where there are, th I don't know how many papers are there. It's, it's, it's an order of a hundred papers written on the subject. It's not so not so widely studied subject. I mean. Any questions? Well, if not, then uh, I think we should go to lunch. <laughs>